If you enjoy the podcast and would like to support the show and hopefully help us to improve it, why not go to patreon.com and search for Ancient Warfare Podcast. Your support helps us to make more episodes of the podcast for your enjoyment and hopefully we invigorate those little grey cells. That's patreon.com slash ancient warfare podcast. We salute those who already support the show. Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. In this episode, we're looking at volume 10, issue 6, Ancient Rome in Turmoil, the Year of the Four Emperors. Don't forget, if you've not picked up your copy yet, you can order it from ancient-warfare.com. So with me today are Joshua Browers, Murray Dam, Mark McCaffrey, Mark DeSantis, and a welcome back to Lindsay Powell. So Joshua, this is your swan song issue as you move to edit Ancient History magazine. Um, I wondered if you want to give us a 30 second pitch on why everyone should now be picking up their copies of Ancient History as well as Ancient Warfare magazine. This is my final um, Ancient Warfare issue, uh, but I was also working on um, issue number eight, which uh, Peter Konieczny of Medieval Warfare, he did a lot of the, the, the groundwork for that, and I just sort of swooped in and, and did some uh, spit and polish on that, and etc. And um, Ancient History magazine, if you're interested in the ancient world, but you don't particularly want to read about bloody battles and wars and, and that sort of stuff all the time, and you want to focus more on everyday life in particular, uh, society, a little bit of politics, culture, um, then Ancient History is the magazine that you, should, uh, that you should check out. I can see them flying off the shelves now after that. <laughs> Uh, it's the well, I sort of explained it in in my introductory blog post that the sort of things that I wanted to do with Ancient History magazine, and that's um, I want every issue basically to tell uh, a particular story, and with Ancient Warfare that's that's much easier to do it. It sort of grows organically because it's, like, for example, like this issue, it's about the uh, the, the Roman Civil War of uh, sixty nine uh, AD sixty nine, um, so you, you sort of. The, the story presents itself very organically, very naturally. You have these these four powerful figures uh, that are vying for control, and there are a few battles, and there is one guy that uh, emerges victorious. So there are protagonists and antagonists, and it sort of goes on from there. But when you have to do an issue, for example, on uh, what we just did, issue 9, uh, on uh, classical Athens, Athens in the 4th century BC, there isn't really a narrative that you can, can can hook into. My predecessor had the idea of devoting that issue to democracy in decline, uh, which is very old-fashioned, a very 19th century uh, way of looking at, at uh, developments in Athens in the 4th century. Uh, you know, because you have the end of the Peloponnesian War, everybody is a bit down and out, and then you have uh, different powers vying for control. You've got the Thebans popping up uh, temporarily, and then Epaminondas dies, and you have the rise of Macedon. So it's sort of like, you know, it's the, the loss of uh, the independence of the Greek city-states and the rise of, of Macedon. And I purposefully try to avoid that for the most part. There's one article in there that, that sort of goes into that. But I really, for ancient history, every issue I feel like it should have a particular story, a particular reason for you to read it, something that it, it tells about the ancient world that you might not be able to find easily somewhere else. And for the Athenian issue, I decided to focus on everyday life. Uh, what was it like to live in Athens in the 4th century BC? What made the 4th century BC different from, say, the 5th century or from later? And that was sort of the angle that we took there. So there are some articles on uh, on famous figures. So the death of Socrates, which uh, Murray wrote about. Um, there's an article on Xenophon. And there's an article mm. on Demosthenes and uh, Isocrates. And uh, then there are articles about... Uh, how wealthy Athenians lived, about what the uh, Agora was like, uh, how uh, Athenian vases were made in the 4th century BC, and how they were different from before. Um, just to give sort of a, a more, let's say, friendly look at what, what it would, would have been like to, to live and walk through Athens in the 4th century BC. And that's sort of the idea that I want to keep doing with ancient history uh, moving forward, to try and, and present this these narratives that have a strong editorial uh, hand let's say the next issue will be royalty for example which which was which is difficult and that's going to going to look at you know what is royalty how do we define that and how did ancient peoples define royalty and aristocracy and how did that work and uh, what were some of the characteristics and how 
hard or easy is it to define what royalty is uh, in an age where you don't have uh, particular um, fixed uh, titles, for example, that are handed by some supreme king or whatever. So ideally, people should be reading both magazines. Yeah, if you want to, if you want a, a full rounded view of the of the ancient world, you should read both magazines. And one comes out one month, and the other comes out the other month. So it's it's perfect. Right. Should we look at the year of the four emperors? Um, I, I don't think we necessarily need to pick through blow by blow because ideally, people should uh, pick up their copy of the magazine. Uh, to read that through uh, because it is you know it, it's worthwhile but i guess for those people who have not yet read their copy um go on anyone to do a short summary Lindsay. oh a very short summary would be um the reign of nero uh after the fire of rome 64 feeling turns very much against the friend caps and it ends up consummating in 68 with uh, various revolts I think there's is it Vindex is probably one of the key ones, if I got that right. Um, anyway, point is that uh, a gentleman by the name of Galba decides that uh, he's going to throw in his hat or his laurel, wreath as it were, and challenge Nero. Uh, Nero ultimately commits suicide and Galba becomes the supreme commander of the Roman world, the uh, He, in turn, is actually three months or so later challenged by another one who, in fact, was a court favorite of Nero, a gentleman called uh, Otho. I think he's famous because he wears a wig. Uh, and the glutton and various other good things which are ripping me on. And then, of course, at the time he assumes power, there's yet another challenger by uh, the name of Vitellius, who takes with him the Rhine Legion. So this is all happening in, in real time. And he beats Otho at a, ba- a battle, as it happens on the Via Postumia. I wrote that article mm-hmm. uh, in the magazine. Um, matters of weeks go by, and already he is challenged by Vespasian. And by the end of the year, the East clashes with the West, and we have Vespasian and the Flavian dynasty. Uh, having swept all before it. So there's a very, very positive version. Is it fair to say, it's not, it's, it's not a power vacuum, but at the same time, it almost is a power vacuum because there's no settled one person who somehow can take charge. Part of your problem is it's it, it, it's not a world in which there are telexes, facts and internet. So if someone does something, for example, Nero commits suicide, famously, and there's a challenger, we don't know when the other challenger's already thrown in name in the ring until he basically makes that known so what i'm saying is is that these ha- things happen overlapping each other because people don't know the other time the other guy's doing what he's doing we would know that today that said it's still amazingly fast moving in a year that's so much uh, 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 you know there's a lot of revolting and emperoring in one year over what's essentially a, a large sp- span of the world other you know, <laughs> of their known world there's a lot of non emperoring really going on. I mean, in terms of Nero, Nero's not, you know, by the end of it, he's not fully in, in charge of what's going on. By the time Don Galba actually gets around to deciding that he might actually lead a rebellion against Nero, um, he's, it's debatable really even in Spain how much of a control he's got um, over what's happening and in some instances is being pushed by sort of other forces be it, you know, people like Otho or be it the, you know, the reports that are coming in from the Northern Legions. There's a lot of bad mistakes being made by these supposed leaders. In the end, a lot of accidents happen uh, and lead to eventually Vespasian coming in and capitalising on everybody else's stuff-ups. Let me throw this as an idea. So the structure that was set up, uh, which is basically uh, a commander-in-chief, the, the imperator, right, who has delegated um, deputies who are called Legati Augusti Proprietori, who, who are scattered around the, the provinces around the, the empire, uh, typically on the on the periphery. Uh, so these are non-senatorial positions. The proconsuls actually tend to be people who run provinces around the Mediterranean. It was set up by Augustus as a means for people not to challenge him. So what you have is princeps in the case of Augustus. We're talking uh, 27 BC, AD 14. So the, you know several years before this year, we're talking was deliberately engineered to make it very hard for people to challenge. So you take the princeps out, you take the imperator out. The system is not really designed to cope it, as you describe it, in a vacuum. It worked in the case of uh, Augustus transitioning to Tiberius because there was a line of succession. You take Nero out of the picture, there is no line of succession, and there is no way to make this thing function properly without chaos happening. Even then, you've got Nero putting in a lot of these... uh these uh, commanders of legions and commanders of provinces on the basis of 
choosing those who are not able or mediocre at, at the very best. Um, you know, if you went back to Augustus, I mean, he's, okay, he is picking from family and, you know, close associates and whatnot, but he's still picking decent, you know, commanders going out there. Um, you know, in terms of what happens in terms of 68 and 60, in, in, eventually into 69, is these guys are, they're just not properly capable of, in the end, making a decision or controlling their troops or capitalising on a situation that they find them, themselves in. No, I think that's a very astute point. And, and, and I think the reason why Augustus was able to rule, use that word very carefully, so long was this amazing man management ability. He saw talent. You can put it in. Those people were only there for about three years. Famously, it was one year to learn the job, one year to do it, one year to kind of transition out um, or plot the, against the emperor, which in the case of Augustus, they never did. But but it clearly began to break down. If, 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 if Nero is not a very good judge of character, is not a very good person who can pick people to do jobs like mm. manage provinces, um, you will you will end in chaos, and that's what we get for you. I think the the interesting thing is also that the the, the legitimacy of who should challenge, I should challenge, no, you should challenge, I'll support you. That whole um, negotiation between the, the legionary go commanders and the governors about which one of them should be the one to... Uh, I mean, you have it with Mucianus, you know, there's an accusation in Tacitus that he was pretending to be emperor and everything but name, but he seems to solidly support Vespasian. Um, so there's a later accusation that he he wasn't on board, but he seems to be on, and the same with the the governor of of Egypt, you know. And then you have other commanders who declared their loyalty too late, or were, you know, were even when they declared their loyalty, they were regarded as suspect. So there's a whole kind of, uh, I think, with the decline of Nero, you have these commanders just saying, "Well, you're of an old family." you've got as much right as he has because he's incompetent, useless, and there's no succession. So there's the sort of, even though we talk about, you know, it's not the modern day, I think the funny thing is that the communication around the Roman Empire is actually incredibly rapid. And I think the the networks of, of merchants and travel and all of these other official um, methods of people getting from one end of the empire to the other is actually quite quick. You know, certainly quicker than it was in the Middle Ages or in much later periods, because you've got a, a continuous government from from one end of Europe to the other, um, and therefore people can travel quite freely and carry information. I think it's also an in between period in terms of you've got some of them, uh, you know, like Otho coming in, you know, trying to and, and Galba trying to stir up, you know memories of, you know, supposed links to aristocratic backgrounds to sort of, you know, cement their claim to fame. Uh, on the other hand, you've got the governor of, of uh, Egypt at the time sort of backing down almost from actually making a claim to anything because he's he's not really certain that they've moved on enough to actually have somebody from an equestrian background actually, you know, really make a proper claim to being having the imperial power. So you've sort of got, you know, it's an in-between period of are we still in, uh, you know, the principate here or are we moved on already? Are we going into a new era? Well, you make a very interesting point, and I'm just looking at the coin that's on page 34, which I got from Roman numismatics. And, and, and the point there is that Vitellius doesn't use the title Caesar. He uses Germanicus, conqueror of Germany, Germanicus. So he's making a very conscious attempt to break from the Julian Claudian. So if you look at, for example, uh, the coins of Otho, I think I'm looking at here, I think it's uh, Otho Caesar, for Galba it would probably be the same thing, uh, and Vespasian, clearly Vespasian Caesar. Mm. So, so what, they, what, they basically, what he is basically saying is the old regime are full of nutcases. I, I'm a fresh uh, broom to sweep all of this corruption away. But is it Galba that sets up his own family tree, you know, statue in the grounds of the palace, I think it is? Um, cl claiming, you know, basically, just like the Julia, Julia Claudians, you know, from Caesar onwards, sort of say, okay, we are descendants from Venus. You've got Galba saying, oh, but I've got this family tree that, you know, takes us from Jupiter on the one hand and uh, Pasiphae on the other, um, claiming, you know, just as good as ancestral, you know, background to the Julia Claudians. It's sort of a com competition for him. Yeah, one has to have breeding, of course, in all these. Uh affairs of state that's part of it one thing that struck me was um 
did, did they actually put themselves forward? They, they seem to have someone else put their name forward. Now, I presume they, uh, you know, oh, no, you'd be, you be emperor. I presume that's some, they're, they're making a statement that they're not a tyrant or something like that. If, if someone's put them forward rather than they've muscled their way into the top job. I was just going to say, I don't know whether that's a literary construction so that they're therefore they're, they're being framed in a way of they're not ambitious, that they've got the best interests of the empire at heart, and therefore that, that's how it's constructed. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's a, a modern, you know, it's all about people positioning themselves in relation to power. Um, and so there's all sorts of literary constructs going on. Um, but... Yeah, it's hard to know. You know, is it is it is it Vitellius and the Goblet of Fire? It's hard to know. Well, I wonder it's also whether it's a sort of senatorial procedure thing. So, uh, you know, people propose motions in the Senate and other people second them, and this sort of thing. it's the sort of republic magistracy approach to power broking, perhaps. Um, in other words, you're, you're not seen. And I think Angus alluded to this. You're not seen as being a, a dictator or a power grabber. No, my colleague here has nominated me. So yes, I humbly accept. The but then Windex, uh, when he comes in, he actually he goes off the back of well, I've I've put it out there. I've uh, got no response from some people, so I'll take that as they've they've actually said yes, maybe. Um, so it, it's yeah, it's a it's a weird interpretation of you know other people's backing. Well, Vespasian, I mean Vespasian's march on Rome when he's not present, and it's only Domitian and Mucianus who are, again is a sort of a odd way of taking power um but it's a very odd year so it seems to be the usual convention <laughs> of all being tossed out yes. uh and, and 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 to use the word vacuum which may or may not be appropriate uh, but that's the best word i think we've got in, in this unstable political situation the opportunist will see a chance and move forward with it uh, the trouble is there are other opportunists who see the same chance i think i mean from from my perspective it's how far down does the opportunism go because you've got you've got um quite low ranking uh senators who are siding with one side or the other who get rewarded for for years to come um and so they've they've obviously hitched their wagon and whether they're all flavian uh amiki early on um it's tricky but uh it's it's amazing how the assurances of loyalty work in the subsequent years because um, you've got the the civilist revolt. Mykenas switches sides. He famously gets locked mm-hmm. up in Cremona in the jail there. You know, and um, th- this is the this is the best general that uh, Vitalis could have had, but he's locked up in jail and can't actually do anything because he's now working for the other side. It's the army that's the power broker. It's the army that puts the man at the top. Presumably, when we when people are referring to legions backing people, presumably it's not whatever the Roman version of Tommy Atkins is. That's that. Who's choosing who he fights for? How, how, yeah. How do the legions democratically choose, or, or not democratically choose, who they're fighting for? Are they just told and off, off, off? Tommy Atkinus goes. I think there's probably be a, there would have been sounding out. You know, it's very um, there's there's talk of getting the tenor of the of the legions and whether they would approve. Which is that being manufactured or whipped up? Um, and you know, are there are there power brokers going around the legions agitating for a particular candidate? Because we know that there are some who themselves to be declared emperor by their legions, or who were, and then they got outnumbered and therefore got um, you know defeated and had to change sides. But it's yeah, it's 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 something again that's not really in our sources, or it's only tantalisingly suggested. But I think it's 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 a it's a complex web. The best example I would give, and I think it's alluded to in probably Tacitus, is the so-called the British legions, who empathised very early in the game with Vespasian because they knew him when he was a commander in Britain and clearly felt a, a, a link there. But to your point, we don't know how kind of deep that goes down. Um, and what's, yeah. what's also very interesting is uh, there would have been presumably AD 43 to 47, let's say, uh, and then Vespasian's, of course, over in AD. So there's something like, you know, 20 years... So really, you think about it, that there's not that many long-service soldiers still in the British legions that would have actually Mm. ever served under him. 
So it yeah. sounds yeah. to me like there's a reputational thing. I was reading something recently uh, talking about, well, some of these legions, if you're thinking about uh, former soldiers being retired uh, near to legionary bases out in the provinces, is there some influence of, you know, retirees coming back and having an influence on the serving soldiery saying, right, you know, keep this in mind. This is what we've been treated as in the past and you are part of our identity unit. And so subsequently you need to continue on these, you know, these loyalties. So these are the veterans and the avocati, the people who were required to... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's an interesting it, point. It also implies a discussion that's going on amongst the legions and their veterans about, God, we've got a crap emperor on the throne. Uh, if X is to happen or when X happens, is this a discussion that, that is going on throughout the Roman Empire about, well, who should who should be on the throne? You know, our commander, you know, should be, which in a way, again, has echoed itself through politics throughout the, the centuries and, you know, is still happening. Th- that it's a conversation that's a widespread conversation that a lot of, a lot of people are happening. So were them aware that they were the power brokers? You know, if legions can be discussing who their loyalty should be for, are they... Should we be saying legions, though? Should we be saying the, you know, whoever's the, you know, n- not necessarily the, the legate of the legion, but in terms of the, the centurion, you know, staffing of legions, should we really be saying those are the guys who are going to be more, you know, creating this sort of loyalty and then exactly so so there's there's almost there's almost a a, a john keegan esque book in terms of the face of roman politics how who who is the one who's the broker is it the centurions is it the primus polis is it is it is it higher or is it lower we, we've talked in previous podcasts haven't we about this idea that the, the centurion is a sort of exclusive club and these people kind of get together occasionally because people know each other they get picked for different assignments and they're moving around all the time but they're special exclusive cadre. And I think from what I gather, um, the traditional idea that is that they are people recruited in from the rankers, that the rank and file is pretty much disproved by Adrian Goldsworthy. I think you sort of see them pretty much as equestrians and sort of appointed into that already. So so they're quite a, an exclusive group of people, well-connected people anyway. And uh, they're making a lot of money. So there's, there's a lot at stake. And when you back one horse over another, you're putting that all on the line. Is civil war profitable for the legions? I mean, or, or, or would they prefer to be plundering over the Rhine? Well, there wasn't much plunder over the Rhine. That was part of the problem. It didn't, it didn't really work for, for Germanicus and it didn't really work for Tiberius or any of the early Julio Claudians. And I think between uh, Claudius, uh, who decided that Britain was where the glory was, there was none in Germany to be had, and Domitian and his failed missions in, against the Catia afterwards, of course, he's the, the, the other son of uh, Vespasian. The action isn't to be had over the Rhine. I think that's been disproved. So the only places you've got left are going to be Africa. Well, good luck with that because there's not much south of the Roman border or, or east. And guess what? There's somebody already there. So uh, you really don't have a lot of places to go anymore. And to go back to, to my favorite character, Augustus, I think he pretty much that worked that out. So we're in an interesting transition. The, the army, which is sort of developed and structured for offensive engagements, it is now having to grapple with the idea that actually the, the frontiers are beginning to form. And we're now an army of, of static positions as opposed to uh, mobile moving around. So the Augustan idea, which was clusters of troops in different theaters of war that could be moved around, now are strung around in, uh, around rivers or hills or wherever they're based uh, as the geography suits. And, and that changes the dynamic. There aren't many places you can't make any plunder and spoil anymore. Hence, when Trojan starts war against the, the Dacians, it's kind of news headline making stuff. There's gold in them, there are hills, um, and they're very keen to get it. But the legions, certainly, you know, it's not all of them, certain legions were uh, bought off. Does that not make the situation worse as loyalty becomes fickle? It didn't help, uh, I don't think. Um, and the fact they were paid different amounts, I mean, the Praetorians were paid a lot more than the regular unit, so um, that, that certainly didn't help. Uh, and there, by this time, there was an expectation that the, ma- the, the man taking control would have an ad locutio and he'd bring all the people together and he would give this donative at them from Caligula. There's some very famous large, I think they're uh, Dupondi or Sesterci, which have him standing on a tribunal and he's basically raising his arms and the standards were in front of him. And these coins were probably given out at the time as a mark of, I'm the new guy, here, here is your bribe, if you will. 
and it, in a sense it's it's a terrible precedent because uh the army if it realizes that can manufacture the positioning of new emperors because guess what and this goes all the way and it, what, later on we see there's a Puritan Axe and all these other kind of famous characters where where it's it's a real profitable enterprise to keep or shortening the emperor's tenures um because there's, there's there's ready money and cash to be made in this project it seems that the roman empire's problem was that it was from the beginning a military monarchy and it, it never had a true uh, i'll call it a royal family a family that somehow was more legitimate than any other family in the empire and that once the succession of the julio claudians came to an end with nero that anybody could be made emperor with at least as much uh claim to the throne as anyone else and it's then it just became a question of well who's got the military force to back him up uh and and this this is a problem that would bedevil the romans for centuries uh, we would see it happen in uh AD 193, after Commodus uh, passed, uh, it would happen all during the crisis of the third century, and um, one of the and, and long after that, uh, what, one of the reasons why I think that Diocletian at the end of the third century, uh, fourth century, no, sorry, third century, uh, tried to I mean, he he divided the empire into halves and had each Eastern and Western Roman emperor take a junior colleague was to forestall the, the some rebellious uh, uh, general from naming himself uh, emperor and marching, you know, trying to seize the the purple, uh, having uh, an emperor on the spot would serve to uh, stop that before it got going. So his his governing system was almost uh, more a question of of taking care of you know, suppressing in, internal threats as opposed to defending the empire against the barbarians. When Augustus uh, effectively is the last man standing, and he's in the Senate, one of the first acts he passes is to double the pay of the Praetorian cohorts. Uh, he realizes that those are the front line, and wherever he goes, there's always at least two cohorts, uh, and they will do anything for him. So you have the same dynamic all the way through uh, to the later periods, and I would imagine that... Uh, Interestingly enough, I mean, you know, the, the only guy that was in, in that bunch of four between Galba, Otho, uh, the Tess and the Spazian that was not the general was Otho, and look what happened to him. The other ones were all military people. As we all know, the, the legions were exact, looked exactly the same as one another. <laughs> as is portrayed in all the films, they're all exactly the same. So, yeah, how did legions fight one another? That's very interesting. It, it, in the Via Postumia battles, the two, the so called bat battles of Bedriac and Macromona, the descriptions that, that, that Tacitus gives us, I, th I think, are quite evocative. First of all, they're, they're basically fighting along a road or on either side of a road, uh, either in daytime or darkness. And uh, on the, I think it's the first battle, they agree they're simply going to put their peeler down. They're not going to throw their peeler. They're just going to go into a, let's put it this way, a, a football scrum or a rugby scrum, mm -hmm. and they're going to push each other back and forward. It's going to be a stabbing contest, and last man standing will win. Is it, o is it also the first one that um, it's because of the terrain that they can't really deploy properly in terms of their formations? And I think it's only two of the legions really actually can actually organize themselves properly and it just adds to the turmoil of it. it. It really is. And it's fascinating. In a sense, what we see is the inner workings of the legion, which is to say when all of the ideal things that it needs to have working for it, either location, 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 and command, 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 uh, when those things are taken away, it, it doesn't function terribly well. Um, and there are all these wonderful descriptions of off those troops all mingled in with uh, civilians and carts and mules and not able to get to their standards. Or in other situations, they can't see and some of the vexilla standards are grabbed by the opponents. So the people go charging after that thinking that's their unit. Well, it isn't. The opponent's now got the unit. And and it, it, it's it's just fascinating how when you start putting people in the same kit and they speak the same language and they use the same drill and the, the, the fighting doctrine, it, it's a bloody mess. And, and you see, I think the, the casualties claimed for the first battle of Adriac are about 40,000. I don't know if that's true or not. It sounds an awful lot, a lot of people to me. But that what's very haunting is the descriptions of the battlefield afterwards, where Plutarch, for example, goes with uh, a former uh, witness to, to the battle 
and he describes how they were, I think there was a temple and how the bodies were supposedly stacked all the way high and he couldn't believe there would be that many bodies. But if you think about it, in a small confined space around a town with a road running through it, it might be possible. And I can imagine that uh, the Roman army did not function very well in that situation. Presumably they're potentially fighting, uh, if not friends, comrades from, from, from the past that have fought with. Well, there's the famous story in there, I think, again, it's related by Tacitus, where a father and a son find themselves fighting each other. And the, I think the father is killed and the son weeps. And, of course, all the men realise around them that what's actually happened, it's a terrible tragedy. And then the line in Tacitus paraphrasing is, and yet they carried on regardless because their job was to kill everybody else that they found. So there's this emotional idea that, yes, we are killing brothers. And I think the, the important thing to realise here, in a sense, part of the storytelling by the Roman analyst uh, Tacitus is to highlight how terrible civil war is. Romans work well in foreign wars, what they call foreign wars. That's to say they, they deal with opponents who are non-Romans. There, there is something sinful, terrible. Uh, it goes all the way back to Romulus and Remus, uh, of a brother fighting brother, citizen fighting citizen. It's bloody, it's awful, uh, and it's, it, it brings shame on everybody. So Vespasian comes out on top. Um, Mary, do you want to tell us what he did to secure the, the peace after winning? Well... I think the most intriguing thing there is in terms of the loyalty of the people that he's got around him. What I think happens is he basically uh, lines up a whole succession of who's going to hold a post as soon as he's in power, but from quite low senatorial positions onwards. So I, I think he secures the Praetor Urbanus positions with uh, loyal followers. Um, there's one who is temporarily kicked out of office because his loyalty is suspect and the others are very clearly Flavian adherents and that continues not only in the, the lower positions but also the consulships for the next sort of six seven years are all men who seem to have been rewarded for their loyalty during the year of 69 so I think that there's a a vast network of securing loyalty there's a big meeting that's held in Beirut just before the march by Mucianus and Domitian with the uh, 13,000 men back to Italy. So there, there seems clearly to have been a, a sort of a vast discussion about what do we do, how do we do it, um, who's with us, who's against us on the way. Uh, so I think that there's, and that I think is taking advantage of of all of the old-fashioned political amici, friendships, loyalties, what we were talking about before, you know, well, the British legions will be with us because we commanded them 20 years ago. All of that, I think, is all mixed in at once. And I think whether there was a a discussion about will will it, you know, is there enough for us to make a run for power, it certainly smacks that way. And what we were talking about before, about people saying, I don't think I can throw my hat into the ring, I'll support you it does tend to suggest a sort of a vast network of of power brokering. You know, well, you've got me, therefore you've got my legions. I'm the governor of Syria. I'll support you. I'm the governor of Egypt. I can't give you any legions, but you've got my grain. You know, therefore, okay, well, we've got that, we've got that. So it does sound like a moving chess pieces around a board and going, right, well, yeah, we can make a run for this because we can know we're in the east we can guarantee that we've got all of the Eastern legions and, you know, certain numbers of the of the Western legions, let's go. So I think it, it, all of that tends to suggest that there was a huge amount of, of forward planning for once they were in power, which again is quite surprising because, well, what if they got defeated? And I don't know whether Otho and the others had, had anywhere near that kind of organisational thinking and behind them. Galva seems to uh, stay behind in Spain uh, at the start of his campaigns in uh, in terms of some sort of administrative you know purpose in terms of planning you know forward planning for what's going to be coming ahead so you know, to a certain extent there is some there uh, Otho on the other hand just sort of follows you know taking advantage of situations as they arise. Well the other aspect of this is that Roman commanders are learners right and, and the, the, the Roman army is a learning organisation so Vespasian, coming later in the game, sees how the other people have played their hand um, and is able to assess the dynamics, okay, with a sort of window of, uh, of delay in news. But, but like you said, Murray, I mean, the communicators are reasonably good. 
Um, so we can imagine that, that he has already seen, okay, now I know that my main contender in this point is Vitellis. I, I know he's the man, and I see how he has been weakened by what's happened, for example, at Bedriacum. Um, and I know his vulnerabilities, and I know that he's not terribly popular. And so, you know, I come along as the, 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 the white knight, if you will. And on page 36 of the magazine, I, I deliberately picked the Aquinarius of uh, Vespasian. It, it shows uh, Pax Augusti, which is um, the, the, the famous idea of Augustan peace, which is variously translated. It could actually be really Augustan pact. It's kind of that special deal that we all agree in with and told the uh, the car part of his way, but significantly you've got Nemesis there, who's the agent of divine punishment for wrongdoing, apparently. Um, and she's holding a Caduceus over snakes surrounded by the words Pax Augusta. And I, I made the point that it's a metaphor for the process of purging post-Civil War Roman society, now under Flavian Emperor intensive care. And my point was this, is that they're cleaning house now. They are going to make sure that nobody else can challenge Vespasian. We see what happens when you don't do this. So all those networks of people, all those favors are called in, as I think what Mary was alluding to. Um, and, and I think this is one of the ways we have to think about Roman society. It was a little bit more like uh, you described as the mafiosi uh, families, uh, all the followers, or all, all the sort of the pyramids of you know, uh, competing interests. And you hope to have as many of those pyramids with you. Um, and in the case of Aspasian, he was in a prime position to Everybody was exhausted at that point. I think everybody looked at him as, are you going to fix this finally? Take it over, run it. Mm -hmm. uh, you may mention the coins there. Do you really think that uh, you know, each of these individuals had control themselves over you know, what was being printed on their, their coins at this time? Because there seemed to be for some very generic statements being made and also certain individuals don't seem to follow the mottos that they're sort of putting out on their coins. Uh, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to believe there was an exercise of control. I mean, I can't, I can't prove this, and I've got lots of books on coins, and there's any number of theories, because uh, it's hard to prove these things, because all you've got is the coins, right? Um, and there's no book that says a, the Royal Mint type, you know, sequence of events. But I think that there was, um, the, 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 the significance was the silver and gold coinage. Uh, I think the silver and gold coinage were minted typically in the Dunham, uh, and I think there are a couple of other places they were minted, uh, and all the low denomination coins came out of Rome. So you could argue that you know, close to power, uh, you've got this, this, this committee that, uh, that pumps out these coins. And in fact, that the low denomination coins become quite generic after Augustus. So there's not much more than the name of a person and some symbols and so on. But the denarii and the aurii continue to have these interesting messages. And, and I have to believe, in the way that Romans, as we've been discuss, discussing here, are somewhat thoughtful in how they leverage different aspects of things. The coins principally go to the army, from my understanding. So from the mints in Lugdunum, from the, you know, the, from the principal places, uh, the, the gold coins are relatively minor, but there's huge quantities of silver coins minted. And they are taking the messages out three times a year to be distributed at the army camps. From that you know, famous windowless office in the Principium where you know, the, the guy hands out the coins. Um, minus deductions. I, I have to imagine that the coins are bright and shiny, and the soldiers looking at this, oh, look at this, you know, this kind of, and then they get spent in the local towns and through trickle down, they end up in other parts of the empire where the purses get much more mixed. Um, and this accounts for when we get these hordes of coins, that they are sometimes quite narrow in their mix. You know, that the, these coins are really clusters of certain types because they've been held on to. So, so I tend to believe on, on, on the balance of the preponderance of the evidence that there was more thought from the, uh, or approval sought by the higher up in, in what went on the coins. It makes sense. It's another form of messaging. Did we see Vespasian make a round of purgings to try and cement his power? I don't think there's purging as such. There's, there's lack of reward. There's people who have been decided upon they are not going to be in the new regime. Uh, Antonius Primus is the, is the most sort of prominent example. There are, of course, still people who are rebelling. Civilis in Germany um, is, you know, st still still gone rogue and, uh, and goes and sort of defeats him in 70. Well, Domitian's there. Whether he commanded or not is uh, up for debate. Um, but I think there's, there's several members who, who don't get rewarded with political appointments beyond uh, the period. So 
it's much less a purge, more of a well, you're not on our team, so you know you're in the you're in the wilderness. But I think the other thing, um, like getting back to what Lindsay was saying about you know we've had enough. I think one of the things about legitimacy that we were talking about earlier is that the the Roman uh, they seem to have wanted succession. Um, and with the Julio Claudians, you know, it took Nero for that to to really be disintegrated. And I think with the Flavian dynasty, again, it takes it takes Domitian for it to again be rejected completely. But there is a there is a a pleasure and a security in having Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Um, and you know, presumably at the start, their offspring would have been intended to to succeed as well. Uh, but then you know. With with the, the the tyranny of Domitian, that all falls apart, and then you get the succession of the the five good emperors on a different model, which all, as uh, Mark was saying, goes to goes to pot when Commodus gets chosen by his father. Um, but I think that there's a the Romans seek out that sort of legitimacy in terms of having a family in power, having having an imperial family gives a sense of continuity. Which is a, a profound irony because the, the Republic, the Respublica, the Commonwealth, which despised regnum, you know, the whole idea of kingship, uh, effectively embraced it by another name. So we talked earlier about um, how troops might have actually been discussing things. And it occurs to me, in, in all the things I've read about the Battle the battles of Adriacum, is the amount of uh, dissatisfaction that troops seem to have expressed in their commanders. And there's that scene at the end of the first one where the two uh, losing camp commanders on Otho's side slink away because they know they're going to get 10 ton of bad noise coming out of the troops if they go back to the camp. But the poor guy, I think, who's, who's left there has to face the music. And, and all the way through, you get the sense of, in, in Tacitus' description, that the troops are near, near mutiny. And it's extraordinary to think that we're, we're, we're given this idea in this, as, as somebody pointed out, you know, this uniform uh, Roman army where everywhere is its own thing, which of course is not true. But the idea of discipline, it, it, it's an incredibly efficient, uh, obeying all the orders. Uh, there is this undercurrent of suspicion and I think these guys are incompetent, don't you, uh, Marcus? Yeah, I think so too. And we saw this under Germanicus, we, we saw that in other, other different people. So, so there's always this element of the troops can challenge their commanders. And it goes back to the idea of the contio, I think, where a, a Roman stands up in front of a people, his, his constituency, and has to make his case to be elected as an magistrate. And I think Roman citizens, even in the furthest reaches, understand that commanders are accountable to them as Roman citizens at some level. And when they show incompetence, they question that. And, and, and if necessary, they will say, you're out, we're taking over. And it's a very different view of a disciplined army. And I suppose that's the reason why they had to, through the, again, things like coinage and, uh, and, and the worship of Discipline, uh, create the impression that we hold these things dear and close to our heart. Because without Discipline, the whole thing falls apart. We can't, we can't go into the realm of chaos because then you have civil war. But the leaders that, um, as you say, slink off at the end of that battle, uh, is it not partly, you know, a hangover of the, you know, they are basically commanders who have made their names during the career of Nero, and then they've come into this, uh, you know, new arrangement of, you know, fighting for Otho, for example, he doesn't really seem to take, you know, much, uh, you know, account of what they have to offer him in terms of advice. Uh, the the battle isn't you know that well planned. Are they you know just trying to think? Well, hold on, what's going to be the reaction? We don't know what necessarily the outcome will be for a losing commander here, um, because the game rules have changed since Nero, um, and you know better to be off and surviving rather than f wait around and see what happens in a, in an uncertain predicament. Well, I'm going to be less generous to them because I, I think that what they realized was they made a complete out of pig zero of it. Um, and, and they would have been lynched. I mean, they, the, the legions were in, in very, very bad shape. I mean, they again, if you if you read the accounts, you get this amazing idea that some are spoiling for a fight and they want to take him on. And the commander is saying, no, you can't do that because we aren't ready. And, you know, and so they do that. And on the other hand, uh, for example, you've got situations where 
people break ranks and they go charging off and then they find they're in a, in a predicament and then Antonius has to go taking cavalry at his own risk to kind of rescue those people. You just get this general sense of uh, not disciplined professional army, but, but dare I draw it, it's, it's a sort of rabble effectively. Uh, and I wonder if this comes back to the idea of the command. The command is not strong. And, and the reason why, for example, Vitellius does so bad at, at Otho, particularly at, 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 uh, I'm sorry, Vitellis at the second battle, is because they've, they've locked up Kaikina, who's the best general that they've got. And you've got these legions marching in to face a much better organized force from, from Vespasian through his surrogates. And, you know, it, they're left to make their own decisions, and, and it's chaos. So unless you have a strong commander on the field, it ends up in, in a very bad place. Should we go to some... Uh questions from the fans from Alejandro on Patreon Patreon questions always get answered if you're not a supporter, you can find us on Patreon uh, Ancient Warfare Podcast you'll find us if you want to uh, tip us a dollar or two it would be very much appreciated um, how aware of the internal turmoil were other regional powers, the client states you would think would be keenly aware how far did this awareness spread any thoughts on that? We've already stated that you know, you spread like wildfire. Well, I haven't researched it, so it was just a step in the dark, but I don't know that there were at this time, we're talking 1868, but there were that many client states anyway. Uh, again, compared to Augustus' time where there were several of them, satellite states around, uh, mm. most of them had either been absorbed in or were actually sided with, uh, uh, with, with Parthia, would have been on the eastern side. So... Um, News spread. I mean, as Murray pointed out earlier, news spread got around. Got around. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. It made that much impact. I think from from parallel situations, we know that the we know that the surrounding uh, empires knew what was going on in politics. And whenever there's a a moment of instability or a regime change, such as when Antoninus uh, Pius dies, suddenly anyone who was looking for an opportunity to attack does the parthians being one of the one of the first to take advantage of anything like that and i think again vespasian uh makes takes steps to stop that from happening by by securing his rear in that regard um but we also know that the german tribes attack when there's the chance that's again what you know occupies marcus aurelius for most of his um reign uh, and even even you know rebels in britain take advantage when there's, there's those sorts of things. So I think, again, uh, there is awareness and there is uh, a hotbed of dissension, and if they think that they can take their opportunity, they will. Um, so, again, people seem to be remarkably well-informed in this this uh, ancient society with no modern communications. What I'm just wondering is, for example, take the Northern British example, the density of troops relative to the landmass they had to guard is, is actually quite thin. I mean, there aren't that many Roman troops per 100 square miles or whatever the metric is so I, I just wonder whether and this comes kind of, again back to the quality of our sources is, is I, I, I'm convinced that all the way through there are attacks and rebellions and all sorts of things happening all the time but the historians tend to like to assign a reason oh well you know the, the reason they did this now is because of those things well if you recast this dio there's one entry I think I forget which year it is it's like 6 BC or something well he basically said Oh, there were lots of lots of things going on this year and lots of military engagements, but none of them very important, so I'm not going to talk about them. In the following year, mm. it's him saying, and so it, it, it begs the question, really, we don't have a complete um, chronology. In terms of the British situation, um, you've got a number of the uh, legions in Britain. I mean, the, the 14th Legion is withdrawn from Britain. It's over active on the continent. You've got vexillations from the other three legions, all active during this period on the continent. Um, there seems to be a lot of troops taken out of Britain at this time. Um, and at the same time, you've got the Brigantes who are, well, they're more focused on causing trouble within themselves at the time. But then again, when you have a look at immediately after this period, you've got Keriolus going back in there and having to deal with the Ordoikes and uh, the Brigantes and whatnot, and sort of mopping up a situation that may have, you know, had its origins during this period, in terms of, uh, you know, the unsettled reaction to troops being withdrawn from Britain. So opportunism, opportunity worked on both sides, didn't it? It was uh, for Romans as as for non-Romans. Well, we, we have one other question, which could be a rather large question to come up with. It, 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 <laughs> 
an answer that's pithy enough. Um, why did the Romans f have so many civil wars? What could they have uh, done to perhaps find a solution? Hold hands? Because they could. They, uh, the, it, it goes back to that problem, a question of political legitimacy and that uh, uh, I call it a military monarchy. It, it was essentially you had a, a monarch backed up by the army, and that's what put him in power. That's what kept him in power. I think that's uh, Augustus. I think that's every other emperor after that. And you no, know, no, obviously in any any state in the ancient world, the the uh, military was going to be a vital component of the power base of a uh, of a monarch. But it would seem to me with the Romans, and, and, and there are several strands to this, that once you got beyond a grouping of rulers, emperors, let's call them, uh, that were regarded as legitimate, these are the people who uh, hold political power, Nero dies, uh, essentially anybody can name himself or declare himself to be emperor, make a bid for uh, imperial power. Uh, and it, 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 the situation did not lend itself to long-term stability. There were periods of stability where I, I think the Romans were very fortunate, say, with the good emperors to go from Nerva all the way to Marcus Aurelius without too many difficulties in transition of, of power from one to another. Uh, but when that system broke down, you, you tended to find... Uh, various generals from various parts of the empire, uh, each declaring himself as the emperor or main claimant. We also see that the Roman Empire uh, had at least four, uh, uh, in these big civil wars of, say, AD 69 or also in 193, you start seeing that the Rhine legions are talked about as, a, as some sort of... Uh, unit or grouping, the Danubian legions, the legions in the east, there's also the British legions, and the, the bulk of the Roman army had been deployed on the frontiers far away from Rome uh, for so long that it would seem to me that they developed almost like their own sort of, I don't want to say a class consciousness, but their own sort of, um, they had their own interests, okay? And the Rhine legions had their commanders. The Danubian legions didn't necessarily support them. They supported their own people. The British legions were uh, very similar. So whenever there was some period of instability, you had differing groups wanting their their guy uh, on in you know, on the throne, and, and that was just another recipe for civil war. So earlier, I talked about, for example, the way that Augustus set up the structure. And, and, and what you had created with the Legati Augusti assigned to a particular province was army groups. So, uh, to mark the point that it is well made in the sense that by appointing someone as the Legatus, the delegate, the man who is the emperor's delegate, the one with, with all the powers to make decisions, and all of the uh, military units respond to him, he does create an army of Germany, an army of the Danube or whatever, and in fact, when, when you read Tacitus about uh, the, the the AD 14 mutinies with um, with the Rhine and the Danube legions, it is because they're grouped in that way. So there's Upper German, Lower Germany, and the uh, I think it's the Rhineian legions. I forget which one or Pannonian, and they are really identifying with each other. And it's one legion can exert power over another one because you say, well, you know, you really didn't didn't want to do this because you know this is the wrong thing to do. When in other cases. The legions who are pro the cause lean on the other ones and whip them up, and then they all start mutinying. So, so I think that the weakness of creating this uh, regional army with a power base is if, uh, if you get a weak commander, and this is my next point, if you don't have good governance, strong command, and the lack of discipline, it becomes weak, and a disruptive development can come along. So, to go back to the uh, the AD 14 mutiny, one of the causes of that mutiny was the recruits to the army of six the, uh, AD, which was sent off to Illyricum to deal with the uh, Petonian revolts there, was basically uh, made up of a lot of conscripts from Rome who had been pretty much press-ganged into serving. 
and they were already now something like 10, was it eight years in, 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 uh, in, in military position, and they were frankly cheesed off. Uh, they were ready to go and they were agitating for better conditions and pay. And when Augustus dies, they see an opportunity to whip the other people who were professional soldiers into uh, following their particular course. And at the end of the mutiny, one of the things that Germanicus does is he contrives to have those men shipped off to right here. He takes them out. He understands that they are a uh, cause of problem and he just moves them out and puts them into a harmless situation. So, so again, there's a good example of good command taking over in, in a situation which has been allowed to get bad. I think there's another factor in terms of the Mos Maiorum idea in terms of, you know, for a lot of the period, you know, a lot of Roman history, it is the way things have always been done. And, you know, people know what the game rules are. And every so often, you know, people want to break those, you know, be it, you know, a, a Sulla or a Marius or a Caesar or, you know, down the line, you know, when things start to fall apart with Nero, it's you get civil wars coming in when people don't play by the rules. But, you know, for most of the time, I think we sort of over uh, over credit the the imperial system in terms of saying it's got its, you know, it, it's got its uh, control over these legions in these different areas. It's more that it's, you know, it's not necessarily by design that, you know, they are actually following, uh, you know, the way things have traditionally been done. Uh, and, I don't know, it's, it's more personalities, in, individual personalities running amok that sort of break the system down. I mean, that's why they keep, they keep t coming back to it after all, you know, time and again. The funny thing is that they tried to solve it. Augustus tried to solve the, the situation because we had the same thing in the first century with the, uh, mm. with the strong generals appearing and then the triumvirates uh, trying to co cooperate, you know, basically them acknowledging, mm. saying, okay, we're all powerful and we all have these armies, let's work together to make sure that we don't clash and at all. Well, we all know how it ended up. And mm. Augustus basically came up with this system to try and prevent what eventually happened again in, in 69. So What's interesting about that point, Yasho, is that once you get a strong leader like Vespasian, who is a, is, is a man with great military credentials behind him, I mean, he's a very seasoned commander, who, who's got his, got his act together, I was going to use another word, but uh, he's got his act together. Um, and that works very well. And as Murray said, it gets to, I think, it's a, a, a mark. it gets to the mission, and it falls apart because you've got a weak commander, and then it's reestablished itself. So by the time you get to someone like Hadrian, uh, who's able to assess the Roman army, and it, but what, what's, what's fascinating about uh, Hadrian is, and I remember talking to uh, one of the archaeologists at the uh, Museum in Israel in Jerusalem, it was the fact he was the prime student of Augustus. He understood that you had to keep going back and doing the basic stuff. You had to tour the provinces. You had to put your face in front of the troops. You had to get them to show their prowess and be able to do the disciplined things. And let's not forget that underpinning the Roman army was this military code, which was a very brutal regime. I mean, it, it, you could walk the people if you didn't do things the way you were told to do them. So it, it's it, it's pretty brutal and there's always discipline comes with the with the, with the threat of violence but it's very very badly veiled because you get you know if we go to the use of decimation um in 68 and if you look at the history of decimation you've got caesar who uh threatens to decimate twice once he carries it out and the second time he sort of says it and the troops go to him and say no um we'll you know will behave, you know, you don't need to take that step. We, we you know, give in to, um, you know, what you're demanding. Um, on the other hand, when uh, you've got, uh, you know, decimation being used in 68, it's, you know, we have to go through de with decimation. This is the, the letter of the law. And then that ends up with them turning against their, the leadership. They're, they're sort of using that tradition, but it's, yeah, it does backfire in the end because it's not... The tradition is it's so thinly held that, you know, one little variation and it goes out the window. Well, I think that to extend that point, uh, I, somebody mentioned earlier about the triangle, uh, Russia, you mentioned about the triangle. Where the things really went wrong, wasn't it, was the fact that you had Pompey, Caesar, Crassus building their own army, swearing loyalty to them and actually being paid by them. And you're quite right, Augustus kind of straightened that out by saying, you swear the sacrament of the public unto me. 
I'm the guy in charge. There's only one now. Um, and I think what you found with going back to this army group thing I was doing is that someone like Galba, the man out in Spain, is appealing to the, the most Moyora might be like, you know, I'm the guy, right? You you back me, right? I pay you, I pay your money because the guy in Rome is not going to, because there's no guy in Rome. I'm the man in Rome there. So it, it, it's a fascinating idea if you blend all of these factors together and at the same time you, you factor in that Roman people are, are a bit are able, I, I guess that they, they consider themselves free to challenge. Mm -hmm. they're, they're encouraged to speak their minds. They're not automatons. And um, I suppose it's a testament to the success of what we call Roman Empire is the fact that with all of these uh, moving pieces, it survives as long as it does. Enough people believe in the venture enough of the time that it doesn't fall apart. I mean, I'd, I'd almost ask, you know, it's surprising that there aren't more civil wars. Uh, and I know that in our sources, you know, the a usurper isn't necessarily labelled a civil war, but, you know, there's not a civil war uh, at the death of Caligula. There's not a civil war at the death of Domitian. There's all sorts of opportunities where if civil war was on the, the tip of the tongue of the Roman legions at all times, the, there were so many more opportunities to have civil wars that that they don't have so in many ways i think that can come back to the traditional they are they are appealing to this is not what you don't do this and it takes extreme circumstances or a, a very charismatic individual to be able to encourage such a thing to occur but similarly you know what 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 leads to a label civil war yes there are several that we call civil wars but there are others that could be counted as a civil war that's just a usurper or it's a revolt rather than a civil war you know and, and again the crisis of the third century you could argue that the entire third century is a civil war we don't say that we're just a succession of usurper emperors but i think certainly in the first two centuries the fact that there are less civil wars than there could have been is is quite surprising and let's not forget that the Romans are very good at using names so for example when uh, when the imperator kaiser imperator caesar who will become augustus uh, has the Senate declare war against his rival Antonius? It's not Antonius they're going after; it's Cleopatra. All right, so they fight a war against a, an enemy of the Roman state who's a foreigner, uh, and he gets his triumph for the uh, I think it's the Alexandrian War. That's one of the as well as the Actian War, and of course his war in Illyricum as well. So, so two of those wars are in a sense declared as being against foreign powers. He doesn't like to describe it as a civil war because that undermines his credibility. Oh, you got to power because you killed another Roman? Tut, tut, tut. That's not the decent thing you do. Did you kill the foreign power? Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, that's a good discussion, but all things must come to an end. Thank you, Joshua, Murray, Mark, Mark and Lindsay. We're back next month with another In Between Issue episode, which we may well be looking at topics surrounding the TV series Barbarian Rising, or we'll be looking at Spartacus. I guess you'll find out next month. Don't forget, if you want to support the podcast with a small recurring donation of a dollar, pound or euro, it goes a long way to helping us create the podcast. Have a look at patreon.com slash ancient warfare podcast and you'll see how we put those dollars to good use. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.